and I'm just going to give you a quick, your book does the uh, Domar growth model, and you should read that. So, Domar, and actually there's another guy, Herod, who's um, tied into this whole thing, but they created this growth model a uh, long time ago, right, in the 30s and 40s, they built this growth model, Herod and Domar. And because we're looking at a, a path, right? Where's the economy going over time? Yes? What is the economy doing over time? Well, we're going to integrate something. And what we care about is investment. Okay? What you're getting is... What you're getting is an increase in capital stock that's creating the growth. Okay? So you might have uh, labor growing in here, but that's exogenous. And you need, what matters is your capital labor ratio. Okay? In growth theory, this is always, almost always what the key is. The economy grows when you increase your capital to labor ratio. Okay, that's what you need is a higher capital labor ratio. So these guys, Domar growth model, comes up with formulas to figure out what the optimal rate of growth is. Okay, the problem, the problem with the Domar model is that it keys off what the interest rate is. Okay, and takes K over L basically as fixed. So as your labor's growing, you need to add capital, and capital labor ratio is fixed. If you do that, you end up with a very bad solution, which is kind of called the razor's edge. And what that means is you have to keep the economy in a very narrow path. You can't stray much from your path, right? Razor blades are very thin. And so you've got to stay on this little thin path, right? And so economists were depressed by this. For a long time, economists were depressed by this. Until along came Mr. Solo. And Mr. Solo builds a model that looks kind of like that. All right? Which this is savings, which is related to FK. And then that's investment, right? And so you have investment and you have K over L and that's the economy and that's your savings. I know, you're very excited by that. Solo allows the capital labor ratio to change. And again, you're like, what's the point here? Well, being able to take an integral lets us find out how this path goes okay so where we had um the razor's edge in the domar growth model in the solo model we're going to have a golden rule and there's going to be this golden rule time path and this stuff okay but the problem with the solo model is that technology is exogenous so technology is given how technology plays in this doesn't really get, yeah. So now we have the Romer model in the modern world, which takes, which builds on the Herod and Domar model and the Solo model. So now we have, you know, we can vary capital labor ratio and technology becomes endogenous. So we build models where we're building, creating tech, the new technological advancement and to see it, uh, creating technological advancement, which creates it. But the key to all these models remains that and the path, the path. So we want a path for the economy and a path for K over L. So traditionally when 
economists say, look, there's this country over here. They're poor. We want to make them rich. What's the trick? Well, the trick is to get more of that. And if you look, for example, look at what Costa Rica has done. Their growth model has been to get companies to come in and build factories. So they have tax incentives and other incentives to get companies to come in. And in doing that, they have raised their capital labor ratio, which has raised their standard of living in their incomes. Okay. And it turns out the trick to doing that was this magic word. So they increased the educational level in their country, which allowed them to increase the level of technology in their country, which allows them to develop more. You with me? And so now we can build these complex models, which are built on integration. Okay. But the trick is, again, they're built on a path. There's a time path. We don't instantly increase our capital labor ratio. We don't instantly turn our economy from a wimpy economy to a great economy. It happens over time, and there's a path. Now, you're like, well, wouldn't we take the highest possible path? And the answer to that is no, because there's always a cost, right? So to get more capital, I need available funds in my financial system. Well, where do those come from? Well, they probably come from savings. So we lower our present consumption to get more consumption in your future. If hopefully someday you'll have a job if you don't already have a job. You put money away now, you save money now so that you'll have more money in the future, right? When you get to retirement, you're able to retire because you have money put away. If you had spent that money in the past, you wouldn't have it in the future. You're better off over your whole life because you've been saving money as you go through your life, okay? But if all you do is save, if you save 90% of your salary and spend 10% and you starve to death before, right, or you just have no fun, you live in a box, right? You live in your car and it's a 75 Plymouth Duster, okay? So you've ruined your life, but now you retire with a fortune. Well, who cares, right? You're old now. Should have had fun when you were younger, okay? So there's an optimal path for how much you should give up in order to, with me, these things are complex. But they're cool, these growth models, right? They might be totally unrealistic, but they're fun and they're cool and they're all built on integration, integrating things. Okay? No? Okay. All right, so quick, chapter 15, okay, differential equations, yeah, all right, so you have things that look like that, that you already understand what those are, right? The Herod the Domar, Herod Domar growth model is a simple uh, differential equation, and you can solve it just by uh, integrating it. Okay? It can be, you can build these differential equations, though, that are way more complexical. Right, where you're dealing with second derivatives, third derivatives, um, and you're doing this over time, right? So you have something that looks like this, the simplest form, all right? And you're like, what is that? So you have an equation basically where y is the dependent variable. Okay, 
And really what you've got here, you're looking at this equation. Now we integrate it. Integrate it. We integrate it. And we've turned this equation into a sum over time t. Yay? So it's a time path. So, for example, you might do this in a market, all right, where you're getting to, here's equilibrium price, okay? And you have a time path for how you get to that equilibrium price. And maybe it looks like that, or maybe it looks like that, okay? But you have this continuous path that gets us to that equilibrium. And that's how normally, normally we think about markets, right? Demand curve shifts. We don't, we think we have some continuous and we just get right there, right? Nice smooth view. All right? No? Okay, fine. Chapter 16 is difference equations. Chapter 16, we have discrete paths. So chapter 15, when, we hear, when you hear, hey, I did a differential equation, what that means is you are figuring out some continuous path, right? Continuous path. I got from A to B, and it was along some continuous path. Difference equations are when we have a discrete path. Okay? No? Discrete path. And we already talked about this. So here's where I am. And then we get a new demand curve or a new supply curve or a new whatever curve. I don't care. How we, what the slopes of these lines are, if, if we move discreetly. If you can't change this, this assumes P, P and Q both change at the same time. If that happens, I can get to what difference equation says, well, what happens if we have to change Q, then P, then Q, then P, then Q, then P, or P, then Q, then P, then, you with me? So if what happens is, I realize that there's a shortage in the market and I just jack up the price. Now there's a surplus in the market. So maybe I produce more. Yeah. And now there's a, and now there's a, and now, the, and now I'm in trouble. Okay. Yes. But again, if I start here, and I realize there's a shortage, and so somehow I jump over here, and then I jump there, and then I jump there, and then, oh, well, I'm going to get to equal, yeah. okay? So, again, depending on the slopes of the lines and which direction we go first, in a discrete world, you can get all kinds of really interesting outcomes. This is, by the way, these are called cobwebs. Like spider things, you know, cobwebs. They kind of look, yeah. Okay. So in the discrete world, you can get all kinds of wacky solutions. So you're trying to come up with a, hey, how do we explain the stock market? Well, some people are going to say, well, I'm going to figure out a continuous path, and that's how I get there. Some people are going to say, you know, maybe there's rigidities. And so the initial reaction is that only P changes, or only Q, uh, you with me? And the whole, now I can draw economies that explode and contract and do all kinds of things in it because of the discrete nature of this. Or I might do it, there might be something in the continuous nature of life that does it. No? Okay, don't believe me. Don't believe me. Okay. 
So, we're good? Yeah, we're going to go practice, and I'll put some, as usual, some practice.